If you could just ask you to bow your heads for a second. I just want to pray for the Dean as he uh, shares his word with us. Lord, I just pray that you fill Dean with your spirit and the, the words that he speaks today are your words. It's a quite a long passage, but I know that uh, Dean is going to pick out some important parts of that to share with you. And you, I pray, Lord, that you'll take away things that you can use in every day and, and be... Um, Filled up to, to share your your own testimonies. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do you put the uh, thing up? Okay. So today, where's the context? It's about testimonies. We've had quite a lot of sermons on Paul. I think the last time I stood here, I gave a sermon about Paul and the miraculous catch. And, um, and then shortly afterwards, we had the archdeacon come and talk about right at the very end of where Paul was. And he had a miraculous catch. And he was reinstated um, as, part of the, as part of the disciples. Jesus forgave him. It was quite interesting what the archdeacon was saying because he was talking about two metaphors, sheep and fish. And he kind of gave us a message, really, that we needed to, you know, what was Jesus up talking about in terms of fish and sheep? And the sheep, Jesus asked him to take care of them. And in a way, that's about us as a church, how we take care of each other, that we need to love one another, have grace for one another. And he said, historically, churches were very good at that. And we are, we're, we're learning to do that uh, as a church. The other thing the archdeacon was talking about was about being fishermen. And it's interesting, we saw two encounters of Paul as, Peter, sorry, as a fisherman, right at the beginning of his ministry and his calling, rather, and then one at the very end. And the archdeacon was talking about, actually, that you and I need to be fishermen and women. And in a way, that's where the sort of testimonies are coming from. And then it wasn't that long ago that we had another speaker who gave very much the same talk about Peter uh, being reinstated with Jesus, about another miraculous catch. Now, when God, I'm just kind of going to give this to you and get you to sort of think about it. When God wants to get on my case, he says it three times. And there's no such things as coincidences. They're godly coincidences. And I'm just thinking, and I want you to go away and think about this. What is God saying to us? He made us have that sermon three times about miraculous fish and taking care of the sheep. And so I've been sort of, this, I've been sort of been thinking about this sermon and... Um, and I was quite struck about um, what the archdeacon was saying. And so I thought I'd focus on a little bit about getting us to be um, fishermen and women, but also to take care of us as well. And I think testimonies um, tend to do that. So that's really the context. That's the real the journey that I've kind of been thinking about over the last X amount of months. So in a way, we see Paul's testimony in here, and I want to kind of just pull things out about the characteristics of Paul's testimony. So, what is it? Well, Psalm t- um, 35 says, I will, my tongue will declare your righteousness and praise you all day long. My tongue will declare your righteousness and praise you all day long. A testimony is a form of praise and honor to Christ. Now, we've been praising God in our worship this morning with our tongues. And I think we've also been doing it inwardly in our, in our hearts. It's not always about the words that come out of our mouth. Every time we tell our story or our testimony, we give glory and honor to God. Now, our story, and not always, we may not feel personally that our stories with our Lord are spectacular. We might actually think they're ordinary Paul's is quite spectacular. I'm not sure mine is particularly spectacular, but they are personal stories. And actually, when we share them, it says quite a lot about who God is and his character. Actually, his character 
was one that he actually came and rescued you. We don't bump into God. He bumps into us. And in exactly what he did to, to Paul, Paul wasn't looking for him, and God bumped into him. Jesus stopped him in his tracks. And in a way, he does that to us. And I think he doesn't stop doing that either. Our, I, our testimony is our eyewitness account of how God rescued us from sin and death through Christ. And how our life has changed as a result. And I think your lives have changed because of Jesus. And they're still being changed. My life, and I praise the Lord, thank God, my life is being changed. And there's a lot more changes that need to take place. But God is amazing. He is merciful and loving. And he thinks we're worth rescuing. And in a way, our testimony, it's about sharing some of that. Just think, that's God's character. That's who he is. He thinks you and I are worth rescuing. We're always worth rescuing. And not just us in this room, but people outside it as well. So why should I tell others? I will praise you to all my brothers and sisters. I will stand up before the congregation and testify of all the wonderful things you have done. In fact, the Psalms are really good about test. They are people's testimonies. They are rich with stories and encounters with God. David has written tons of testimonies. And there are loads of people who have no idea who wrote those psalms. But they did as a way of praising and giving thanks to God. So why do we? Why do we tell others? It helps others to know what God is like. Again, it's that character. You know, Paul was sharing his testimony with King Agrippa, Bernice and Festus, and all these high-ranking officials. Now, you and I may not. I'm not going to say we won't, because we never know. God can do all sorts of things. Um, and I think he's done all sorts of things in our lives, which have been quite, a, quite frankly, been a bit of a shock um, to us at the time. I certainly it has been for me. We may not have kings and high-ranking officials before us, but we do have an audience. Every single one of us have an audience, whether it's at home or work, In all sorts of ways. And we've got opportunities to witness to them. And that's what Paul was doing. Why else should we tell others? You might need to flick it. I don't think it's working again. Thank you. Other reasons, it's an encouragement. And I think as a church, we need encouragement. We need to encourage others. Let us continue to consider how to motivate one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another even more as you see the day of the Lord coming near. We need people to give testimonies in this church. And actually people do do that. I don't think I'm very good at this day doing testimonies, so I shall give my testimony later on. And sometimes they're about, what's my journey with Jesus? And they're also about my continuing, our continuing journey with Jesus. You and I, in this church, need encouraging one another. And testimonies are quite a good way of sort of doing that. It's interesting, a real kind of phrase, um, not neglect to meet together. And I think that's something as a church... We're, I think we need working on. That's why home groups are really important when we meet each week. But actually coming here, we come here to worship God. And actually we also come here to, to encourage one another and actually to worship God together. So it's really important that we don't neglect meeting with one another. And sometimes we're tired. If I think about home groups, oh, it's home group in the week. Oh, I'm tired. But actually, I'm always really glad when I go there. Because actually, isn't that right? <laughs> My home group over here. It is, we're tired, and it's sometimes you're thinking, oh, it's the last thing I feel like doing. But actually, it's really important. It's important for me, and it's important for the people in my home group. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. Actually, we come and worship Jesus, and we say thank you. 
And we tell stories about what's Jesus doing in our lives. I can remember my first vicar. Dean, what's, the, what's God doing in your life? And I think, ah, what is he doing? But I'll talk about that sort of later on. Testimonies are not just about my journey. How did I become a Christian? They're also really important when we're going through difficult times. And we've actually had quite a few of those. There are people in this church that have come up quite regularly and said, I'm going for a tough time. And we've seen tears. And then they've said, but this is how the Lord is strengthening me. He's not saying that everything is totally transformed. I prayed to God, wow, I'm, I'm lifted out immediately from that situation. That doesn't quite work. It can happen. God can do everything he wants. But actually, sometimes those tough times do us good, which is a really hard thing to say. For they, they're part of our story of who God is in our own life. I was in this situation. I was in this tough time. And the Lord was with me. He strengthened me. And again, we need need more of those. I think the Lord is very busy in our lives. And if he isn't, we need to have our eyes open and we need to spend some more time with him. I think the Lord is very busy in our lives. Or he wants to be. He wants to share. He wants us to meet with him and to bless us. Other reasons. It reminds ourselves. Actually, this has been a really quite hard sermon for me, especially when I do my testimony. Because I think, what is God to me? Why am I a Christian? What has the Lord done? And it, as I talk about this later on, it's really important that we stop and pause and reflect upon who God is. In and of itself, that is really important. Reflecting on God. This is why we need to spend time with him alone. And we can do that here. But we need to meet with him alone. And think about what has he done for us. There's a song or a passage where it says, you know, we should count our blessings. I can't remember how the rest of it goes. One by one. Come on, I need some help here. I can't, how does it go? A name and one by one. Yeah. It will surprise you. And sometimes we think that, oh, you know, I just, I've not met the king. I've not had a road to Damascus experience like that. Mind the little small things. I think the Lord, the Lord does lots of very small things. And then we tend to kind of think, oh, that's, it's only small. But actually, they are still blessings. And I think the Lord is in the very small things. He can and he has done very big things in my life, as he has in yours. But most of the time, he might just be with you, strengthening you. And it's really good, it's really important that we pour, spend time with him. And, yeah, list them. What has the Lord done for me? What's he done for you? And give him praise. Because it hopes, it gives us hope. Our testimonies should always point to Jesus. That's really important. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. It's almost a promise. It's, look, in this world, you are going to have troubles. Being a Christian is not easy. In fact, the, whether you're a Christian or not, you are going to have troubles. That's the truth. It doesn't matter whether you know God or not, you are going to have troubles. And Jesus says, you are going to have troubles. But in him, we get peace. And if we don't know that peace, that's why we need to meet with him. We need to spend time with him. And not one-offs. Let's get into that habit, those little pauses in our day, spending time with him, getting to know him. Take heart. Take heart. Be encouraged. I have, Jesus, have overcome the world. That's his promise. He's He's got the victory. He will give us strength to go through those those hard times. And he's given us a family to encourage us as we go through those hard times. So we're not kind of like individuals here. This is why 
Sometimes you think, oh, church. But actually, church is a people, and we need each other. And that's about being the she- that's, that's the sheep aspect, doesn't it? Take care of my sheep. We're to look after each other. Listen to each other. Encourage, pray for one another. Jesus has given us a family. Okay, how do we prepare for our testimony? I'm going to give you some homework later on. Pray and spend time thinking about our journey and our experiences of God. Pray. Have that conversation with God. Okay, what? It sounds horrible. God, what have you done in my life? It almost sounds. But pray. See what the Lord places on our heart. Ask the Lord, ask God for our guidance, for guidance. And thank him and praise him while you're praying and preparing. Use it as an opportunity to worship. That pausing, being still. Let's listen. What has the Lord done in our lives? How did I get here? What is he doing? Take some space. The Holy Spirit be at work in us. And then give him thanks and praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing that. Okay, let's have a look at what Paul's structure is. Paul is very simple. It's a before, a how, a since, and a challenge. So, we're probably fairly familiar with Paul's life. But basically, the before part of our testimony, particularly if we're looking at our conversion, or how we become a Christian... This is what we were like before we met Jesus. So it's quite possible that you can become a Christian. You can go to church, say, yes, I tick through all the things, say the things, and not know Jesus. I think I was a bit like that. I should talk about that in my testimony. I don't think I really knew Jesus when I first came to church and did that prayer, accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I didn't know him. But then that's the journey. That's the opening the door, isn't it? And it's the stepping in. That's what's taking place in the before. It's what is our motivations? What are we searching for? What's our emotional state? What's our attitude and behavior? How are we trying to satisfy our current needs? Before we met Jesus, how did we try and satisfy our needs? Uh, inner needs could be loneliness, fear of death, insecurity. It could be, we could try, those are our fears, we could try and satisfy those for work, being busy, 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 the pursuit of more money. It can be through all sorts of drugs. It can be through relationships, trying to almost find, uh, get, find a family member or a friend to almost like satisfy that, that relationship and sport and sex amongst others. So what was Paul like? And in his testimony, what was he like? He wasn't very nice, actually. Poor Saul was not very nice, was he? He was a strict Pharisee. And in that passage, he was opposed to Jesus. That's what it said. That's what Paul said. I was opposed to Jesus. I was a persecutor of Christians. He was full of zeal. He would almost probably be a workaholic. He was full of hate and violence. He was hard-hearted. That's who Paul was. If you read through the book of Acts, you get a real flavor, and in fact some of his letters... That's who Paul, that was who Saul was. He was changed. He, need, he did need a, ch- uh, a name change. That was his new identity. This is what I was like. When I was Saul, I was this. Now, we might not have all those characteristics, but we might have some of those characteristics before we knew Jesus. And we might still have some of them while we know Jesus. That's maybe something that is working in us. Right, the how is when we share our testimony. How did we come or begin to trust and follow Jesus? How were we converted? What were the circumstances and the events 
that helped us to consider Jesus a solution to our searching. What were the steps? I think for a lot of people, including myself, I think there are steps. Paul had a very big step. That's not my experience. I think there are little steps that led me to becoming a Christian. And I think that's probably for most people in this. I'd like to hear this in the future. Not this week, the next couple of weeks. So what did we say? On, on Acts 26, it records what happened to Paul. I'm just going to paraphrase. And even Paul paraphrases. He doesn't give the whole, the whole story. But he was on, on the way to Damascus. He had some instructions. He had the authority to gather up those pesky Christians. And actually Jesus came and basically stopped him in his tracks. It was a blinding light. He probably fell off his horse. And so did the other people who were with him. He couldn't see. And he heard a voice say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's a really quite a dramatic encounter. That was pause. That's part of his testimony. And I don't know if it was that point, but I don't know if it was King Agrippa said, you're insane. That's what what King Agrippa said. What happened next since? So we've had, this is what I was like before. This is how I began to trust in the Lord. What am I like now? How has Jesus made a difference? I think people are really interested in this. How has Jesus made a difference? In fact, hopefully they've started to see some of this difference. Which I think is really hard sometimes. I think we, um, and this is firstly for me, sometimes I feel that Jesus hasn't made any difference. It's very difficult sometimes to kind, he has, when I look back, I wouldn't be here um, doing this. But sometimes I think some of those differences are gradual and they're slow. And he thought, actually, I don't think I've really changed some of those, those things I'm actually happy with. Wouldn't it be really good if that just went? And some of that is slow. There'll be some noticeable changes, but I think actually it's a journey. We've been that posh phrase, sanctified. Okay, that's the, uh, the theological word, sanctified, for a process of time. How has your life in Jesus made a difference? How has his forgiveness impacted upon you? What are your thoughts, your attitudes, and your emotions? How is Jesus meeting your needs? Paul says in Acts 26, I have been obedient to the call of Jesus in my life. He preaches to the people that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And that has led me to be here today. Now, I'm not in front of King Agrippa, but I am here today. And certainly when I go back 19 years or even before then, I would have never imagined being here. And sometimes that's why it's really important to reflect back when I was 29. In fact, if I go back to 35 years, would I ever imagined being here doing this? No. It's really important that we do this. We, we think about, how have I changed? This may be something in our home groups we might want to talk about. Perhaps people around us have noticed changes. Oh, I knew you when you were dot, dot, dot. Look at you now. Okay, what's the poor structure? So what happens next? So I think I moved on a bit Poor structure. Yeah, what happened next to, um, I think I've lost a page. Hang on. Oh, sorry, I haven't meant the challenge. Sorry, yeah. This is the difficult one, the challenge. Paul is not having a cup of tea, or there's nothing wrong with that. I think you can have some great testimonies in that. But Paul knows and loves the Lord Jesus. And he actually wants you to know it as well, or his audience. Paul loves Jesus and wants others to know the love of Jesus also. 
And so in some respects, we could do with, and Paul does this, have a little bit of a challenge. He said, well, this is me. What about you? Paul's not really thinking about his change at this point, actually. He's not doing his testimony. He said, great, I can do my testimony, and they're going to let me off, and I can do whatever God wants me to do. I'm not sure he's actually thinking about his chains there. He's thinking about, wow, I've got this amazing audience in front of me, and they want to know what God, who God is. They want to know who Jesus is. Right, I want to tell them, this is my story. And then he starts to challenge them. He asks questions. He says, I know you know this. I've had conversations with you. He makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not saying that we need to make people feel uncomfortable. But he does have a challenge there. So when you've said your testimony, whether it's about your conversion or your witnessing about, I'm going for a tough time and this is what Jesus means to me, this is what he's doing, I would personally pray at that point. I've said my word, I want to pray and ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. I think this is really important. What happens next? I have no idea what happens next. And sometimes pausing gives person in the hearing they might want to ask a question they might not want to ask a question but they are still processing what's been coming out your mouth and sometimes you and I do not like silences and so we just jabber jaw away and say okay do you want a cup of tea oh what's on telly tonight allow some space pray for the Holy Spirit to that point Pray, come Holy Spirit. I've been faithful. I've shared my story with you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, Holy Spirit? Wait, don't rush. Let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. If you've said something about how the Lord strengthens you, An easy question will be, well, where do you get your strength from? Or it may be, what's going on in your life at the moment? If you were bold, you could pray for them. Is there anything you want me to pray for? I don't know what happens next. You have to pray. You have to pray for the Holy Spirit. Allow him to come in. See what happens. And you know, it's probably messy, but that's, that's the Holy Spirit's name, messy. The Holy Spirit is messy to us. Now it's what happens next. Well, let's have a look at Paul. Of course, everyone in that room just fell on their knees and said, yes, I repent, I've been evil, I've been corrupt. Please, Jesus, save me. Save me. That's what happened. That's what the book of Acts says. Because nothing like that happened. He was said, you're insane. I will declare your righteousness and your salvation every day, though I do not fully understand what outcome will be. Let's just rest in that. Though I do not fully understand what comes next. Lord God, I will come in power of your acts, remembering your righteousness, yours alone. Have a little bit of peace about this. It is the Holy Spirit that converts people, not you. And we've really got to remember that. It's not, the, it's not us. It's not because you weren't very good. It's not because you weren't, weren't perfect. Often, if I've had opportunity to do this, and afterwards, I'm thinking, oh, I wish I'd said this, and I wish I'd said that, and I wish I'd done this. Well, you didn't. It was what it was. Unless the Lord, ask the Lord to bless it. And quite frankly, he can work through all these things. And what we think is important is probably not very important to him and what the Holy Spirit is doing. Even our clumsiness, the Lord is able to to transform. My friend, I won't say it's my testimony, but said, you know, um, do you think Jesus was real? That came out of the blue. That was at a dinner table. Uh, I did this dinner party, and I've told you this before. And um, said, do you think Jesus is real? Straight out of the blue. There was no God conversation beforehand. 
I paused and stopped, and no one had ever asked me that question. And I said, yes, I think he did. Now, I thought Jesus was a bit of a myth type of person. And I think believing in Jesus, that he actually existed, was an act of faith. I know that's not true now. He actually did exist, and there is evidence. Um, But at the time, I didn't know. Now, actually, that tipped me over the edge, and I became a Christian very quickly after that. I said that to Nicola. She can't even remember it, which I just found deeply shocking and slightly upsetting. (laughs) So, we don't know what the effect is, the words we say. I do not fully understand what outcome will come. Praise the Lord. He knows, and it's up to him. I've done what I've done. Lord, you sort the mess out, okay? That's always a good prayer. Sort the mess out, Lord. (laughs) What does the gripper say? Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that no, not, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these change. The king rose with him and the governor and Bernice and all those sitting. And they talked about actually he shouldn't be in chains, he should be let free. But it doesn't record what were they thinking after they heard his testimony. And what happened in the next five, ten, an hour, day, two days, week? It doesn't record any of that. And so they said, you know, Paul could be standing there in his chains and they said that and they all walked out. Not one of them com- converted, not, not one of them. But he doesn't know that. And this side of heaven, we do not know how many of those people were later to become Christians. We just simply don't know that. The people who have sown in my lives and have talked about various things, they have no idea that I'm standing in this room preaching this um, sermon. They don't know that. A couple of thoughts. Be careful of selfie testimonies. Selfie testimonies are just about me, me, me. Actually, I think I used to do a little bit of these. I became a Christian for all these obstacles, and then I found Jesus. Our testimonies are never like that. It's actually Jesus come in and bumped into me. He did bump into me. Okay. Look, God is great because of me, me, me. We've just got to make sure, and Paul is very, very good at this. He always makes sure that he's talking about Jesus. And we do need to bring it because it's Jesus that transforms. It's Jesus that saves us. We are rescued by him. It's not because I did this and then I become a Christian. It's almost like the Lord is in all of that. So you've just got to be a little bit careful. Words and deeds matter. I don't want to just say the words are just... uh, uh, not important. Deeds, deeds and words both matter. I just, this is just an important passage for me. You know, Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is somewhat, I have to pray about I, this one because this is quite important for me. Our lives and how we live them does matter. You can preach the gospel, are we living it? And Even if we didn't preach it, our lives should communicate something about the Lord Jesus. It should raise questions. R.T. Kendall, in his book, Sermon on the Mount, which is actually outside, gives a little story about this lady, and she was a Christian. She didn't really, was one to sharing her faith, and she didn't really talk about Jesus. And... um, she said that someone came up to her and said, you know, there's something different about you. The way you live your life, the way you handle yourself. What is that? Is that because you're a vegan? <laughs> People won't know the reasons why we are the way we are unless we actually kind of say something about Jesus in our life and how it's important. It's not that Jesus is a secret. He shouldn't be a secret in our life. We can be sometimes a bit embarrassed, and I have been guilty of that which is kind of worse, I've been ashamed of the gospel. And I think there are stepping stones here. Certainly that's what it was like when I first became a Christian. 
So words and deeds are really quite important. Right. <laughs> you stop lying. A um, bit of homework application. I don't. I want to give my testimony in a minute. It'll be brief. And I don't want anyone else necessarily to, I don't want you to do yours today because I'd like you to think and pray in the week. Okay? I'd like you to practice this. Spend some time in the week. This is an amazing thing. You're going to meet with God. How awesome is that? You're going to go to the King of Kings and you're going to invite him in, perhaps with a cup of tea. And you're going to say, Lord, who are you to me? Why am I a Christian? Spend some time with the Lord this week. Ask him to reveal. Write down those blessings one by one. Follow Paul's structure if that's helpful. If you want to say, this is how I became a Christian. A lot of people find that really difficult. I'd say most of you in this room will find it difficult because you are lucky because you come from Christian families. I'm a born-again Christian when I was 29. Okay, I had a life before, and I didn't go to a church family. And so it's, I, I can do those types of testimonies. But most people, most Christians, find that very hard because there wasn't, I wouldn't say a defining moment, but it was like a gradual thing. And that's really good. So you might want to say next week, why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? Who is Jesus to you? What are your experiences of him in your own life? This will be such a blessing. I really encourage you, please, please, please do this. It will be an act of worship. It will be good for you because it kind of, and I think it just helps you to have, your foundations will be stronger because of this. And I think it can give you boldness. Actually, and I'm not saying it's going to take, this has taken me ages to do this in my testimony. And I, I found it quite difficult. So uh, I, I, it took, I had to think about it over several days. That's good. It's good to spend time with the Lord. How has he made a difference? Right. So what's my, what's my story? I don't, I'm really bad at giving. I, I apologize, I don't te- do testimonies very often. Partly because I preach and I give you little insights so that's my get-out clause. I don't really do testimonies. I wouldn't say they're very... I find they're very easy. I'm going to have a slight... Okay, it's okay, fine. Okay. It would be really good if next week if we could have some men. Men, I'm sorry. You and I are not the best people are coming up forward. We are reluctant. I'm really happy that women do this. The Lord is clearly doing amazing things. He's obviously doing in no... The men is clearly not doing anything. Okay? I'm being really mean now. Okay? I don't believe that. I think the Lord is doing massive things in our lives. Every single one of us. Okay? Please, can the women do some testimonies next week? It would be really good if some of the men gave testimonies next week. It's rare. Um, Brendan gives testimonies. He's given a number of testimonies up here. Thank you. <laughs> next week, okay, we want, some, we want some men next week to give some testimonies. Right, this is mine. I'll keep it brief. Okay, the before. You know, I've always felt, personally, like a square peg in a round hole. My interests, the things that I liked... Um, I would call perhaps niche. I liked classical music. I liked politics. I liked all sorts of things. And actually, those weren't the things that people liked around me, in all honesty. Um, In many respects, I was quite lonely. There's big, big chunks of my life where I've been actually quite lonely. And I've been searching. A square peg in a round hole. I found... Politics was where I was immensely satisfied. Politics has always been a big part of my life. I'm just going to pause for a few minutes, okay?
Okay, what was I like before? I would say I was quite alone. Um, I felt like a square peg. I think there's people in this church who feel like a square peg in a round hole. And I was searching. Politics, and I've told you a little bit of that um, before, was my God. It was my idol. Because suddenly there were people around me you were like me. It gave me a purpose and a belonging. And for me, those are the two characteristics that I think are really important. A sense of belonging and a purpose. I think, why are we here? What is the point of all this? That's where I'm starting from. Politics, I now know, was part of my journey to Jesus. Not that they were Christians, but it, it got me into places where actually... God was sort of preparing me. I was very much involved in labor politics, and I did lots of campaigning, electioneering, standing for elections, all sorts. And then in 1997, some of you would be horrified by this, but when Tony Blair won, it was almost like I'd achieved everything in my life. I'd been working on that for all my life. And then suddenly it happened. And I thought, what next? And then because it was almost like, well, that wasn't particularly massively fulfilling. There was still that gap. What happens next? I was also in the process of just finishing my degree and moving to Greenwich to do my teacher training. And it was really an encounter. This is the how. Um, as I say, that dinner party. Who is Jesus? So did he exist? Yes. But not knowing that. And then, uh, I, I like reading books. So I picked up um, a, a book from my friend's shelf. It was the Alpha Course book. And I picked up the, and I read, read the chapter that said, Prayers. The one thing that the Church of England middle school did for me, there was no sense of God, Jesus, or Holy Spirit there, but it did teach me how to pray. The Lord's Prayer, the food one, uh, <laughs> and the grace. Okay. I can't even remember how the food one goes now. For the food we're about to receive, okay? We'll do that later on. So that's so, you know, God is in there even before I knew him. He used that. And I became a, a Christian for reading that book. And then I was sent straight to Luton, which I would call my wilderness years. <laughs> I don't call that anymore. Um, I felt like it was, it was just, I knew no one here. I was literally, I felt like I'd been cut right back, pruned. This is why John 15 is quite important to me. I felt like I'd been really pruned. I didn't know anyone. I didn't particularly like Luton. I didn't like my job. But he gave me a church and a family there. And I would say that that church is the only reason why that family, that's why church matters, that family helped me to continue to be um, a Christian and to stop in Luton, in Luton, which has been a real big blessing for me. So he gave me a purpose and I had a sense of belonging. I also felt that there was an acceptance. I didn't feel quite like, and I, don't, and I have this here as well, I feel like I don't feel quite like a square peg in a round hole, actually. And that's a good thing. That church, and I think this church for me, I don't feel like I don't fit. Which is amazing, and I love that. That tough, that wilderness in Luton. I lived in a um, studio flat with no central heating for three winters. What a great time that was. <laughs> it was a great time. I had two or three duvets on the bed. I used to wear loads of clothes, but God was really there. And because I had no, it cut all my distractions. And so I had to seek and knock. And I found, that's what he did to me. 
I wouldn't say it was great in so many ways. I'd kind of, my family up on Worcestershire, okay, my friends there. I'd been uprooted, but he'd give me a family here and a purpose, and he realigned me. So politics is no longer my God. I have a proper God. His name's Jesus now. I praise the Lord for that. So why am I a Christian? I nearly finished. Why am I a Christian? There's three things. Number one is mercy. Thank God for his mercy. We had little echoes of this today. Do you know, I keep on making things wrong, getting things wrong. I'm still messy, rough around the edges. There's things I'm not happy with my, in terms of myself. God is very merciful. I love the parable of the prodigal son. It's never, you know, the Lord's arms like this. Praise the Lord that his arms are like this. They're always like this. He is merciful because of Jesus, his, pride, his place on that cross. That is why his mercy. The second one I get, he is my strength. The things that I have done, even standing in here, being a teacher, being church warden, I know I could not do those things in, my, in, in myself. I have to spend time with the Lord and he strengthens me. There's nothing special about me. I'm special to God, but in other ways, I'm not really special. The things that people used to... A school was never a great time for me, academically, in all sorts of other ways. It feels like a miracle that I can be here preaching, teaching economics, and being a teacher. Uh, it does generally feel like a miracle. When I see my students, I'm thinking, well, I'm not one of you. I was never like you, Ever. But the Lord has been my strength. The third thing is, he teaches me to be still. I've got a very busy life and a very cluttered mind that's always on the go, whirring. And I'm rushing around, and the Lord's saying, why are you doing that? He is teaching me to be still and know he is God. Being still in his presence. He is merciful, he is my strength, and he's teaching me to be still. My challenge, what is your strength? Where do you get your strength from? And do you know what it's like to be still and know God is God? We've overrun. God knows how long this has taken. I praise the Lord for this. (laughs) Um, Spend some time next week. I want to know about what your story is. What's God doing in your life? Encourage us. Be a blessing to us. And I promise you, the Lord will bless you by spending time with him this week. He will bless you. Amen. Thank you.